Good morning. This is uh, Senate Judiciary, uh, Thursday, January 20th, 2022. We're taking up a bill, S-254, which deals with qualified immunity. Um, and I'd like to offer an opening statement to begin the discussion and uh, try to make clear uh, some of the motivation here. It's important to ensure that the doors of our justice system are made open to those who've been harmed, including those harmed by wrongful government action. The civil court system is how we solve disputes, how we keep society peaceful and ordered. <clears throat> it's how Vermonters access justice. The George Floyd tragedy inspired me and many of my colleagues in the legislature to dig deep into the intersection of civil rights and civil policing. We must find every opportunity to update our laws and do better. Like most people, I support they are essential to public safety. I also believe in civil rights and the right to redress if you've been harmed by the government. Since the tragedy of George Floyd, working together, we've improved fair and impartial policing policies. We've enacted modern use of force guidelines. We've improved police officer training. And we've supported universal body cameras, which have been an asset to both law enforcement and the general public. Now in focus is a major gap in the law, which is ensuring access to justice for victims harmed by unreasonable police misconduct. Oddly, the way it works now, with little rhyme or reason, some victims gain access to justice while others have the door slammed in their face, even when the police misconduct causes serious harm. <clears throat> the doctrine of qualified immunity that sometimes shields police agencies and officers from accountability for wrongfully causing injury to citizens was created by the courts. <clears throat> the elected lawmakers in the Vermont legislature have never directly looked at the issue of qualified immunity, which doesn't make sense. So I, along with several colleagues, introduced a bill modeled on recent bipartisan laws passed in other states, such as Colorado. The bill would create a way for victims harmed unre by unreasonable police misconduct to seek justice and guarantee that every police officer acting in good faith is 100% financially protected or indemnified by their employing police agency. Before we introduce this legislation, I, I learned that the call for change comes from all sides of the political aisle, not just the left. In fact, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, who I don't agree with very often, has raised concerns about the absurdity of the application of qualified immunity in misconduct cases, calling the court's qualified immunity precedents freewheeling policy choices. This conversation is not and will not be about tearing down police officers but instead is about ensuring that people harmed by extreme negligent policing or the rare but unacceptable bad faith policing have access to compensation for their injuries. If a Vermonter that is harmed by an unreasonable violation of his civil rights, loses work, sustains injuries causing medical bills, or has their reputation, reputation tarnished, the law should offer them more than sorry, no justice for you. Good luck, you're on your own. Fixing this law in a balanced way will help restore trust in community policing and boost police officers' confidence in their good faith policing. I look forward to hearing all sides of this issue. And when we consider it in, Senate in the Senate Judiciary Committee, and if there is a better way to balance accountability and fair access to justice for all civil, ri civil rights violation, I want you to know I'm listening. I am not stuck on just this particular solution. If there is a way to make the application of qualified immunity more consistent, we should do that. If there is a way to, another way to accomplish the goals, we should take that way. However, I don't feel we should be ignoring this issue any longer. Um, and with, with that, I'd like to give you one example from my own district. When two police, uh, two sheriff's deputies were driving to Bennington for a court hearing with two offenders in the back of a van, 
they somehow decided to get involved in a high-speed chase with a speeder on Route 7 South. Now, I don't know all the details of that. And luckily, nobody was injured. But I got calls from several of the parents of these individuals. I got calls from my members of my community. When I called the sheriff, I was basically told of Bennington County. I was basically told, none of your business. This is a personnel matter. I'll take care of it. What am I supposed to tell my constituents? So what I told them was call the sheriff. But this isn't a great answer. If something had happened, what would have been the redress for those uh, families or those offenders who were in the backseat of the van? It troubled me. And so when folks approached me about perhaps introducing this bill, that was one of my motivations. Um, so many of you who are on the other side of this have worked closely with me over the last 30 years or however long you've been in government. I think you know me. I am a supporter of law enforcement. I'm not against uh, police. I've never joined in a call for defunding or tearing down. All I've wanted to see is improvement. So with that, I hope that we will be able to uh, do this in a, in a, take this up in a manner that is normal for the Senate Judiciary Committee to look into issues. If at the end of the day, this bill doesn't have three votes in this committee, it dies. If at the end of the day, we see that there are other ways to improve, improve the system, then we should go forward with those other ways. So with that, I thank you uh, for listening to me. I'm going to turn it over to Dan, Ben Novoskrowski, our newest member of the Legislative Council who draft this legislation and work closely with the co-sponsors throughout the process. So Ben, if you would walk us through the bill, we'd appreciate it. Thank you, Chair Sears. Uh, yes, Ben Novoskrowski, I'm an attorney with the Office of Legislative Council. And Senator Sears, with your permission, I'll share the screen to uh, yes, go through the bill. Great. One moment, please. Can everybody uh, see the bill? Yes. Yes. Uh, before you start, um, a member of the audience, and I have no problem with live transcriptions, and I've okayed that. I just want to caution that sometimes those transcriptions don't um, don't accurately reflect what was said. Um, and so just with that word of caution, later on, as I understand it, YouTube fixes the transcription uh, to what it was supposed to mean. And so generally we haven't used it, but since a member of the uh, folks here have asked for that, then I'm going to allow it. Go ahead, Ben. Thank you. Um, as you can see, this is S-254, uh, an act relating to creating a private right of action against law enforcement officers for violating rights established under Vermont law. Uh, this bill proposes to create a private right of action against law enforcement officers for violations of Vermont constitutional, statutory, and common law rights. Uh, this bill also proposes to waive the use of qualified immunity as a defense in such actions and provides for qualified indemnification of law enforcement officers by law enforcement agencies. Um, as a quick overview before um, I get into the bill, this bill essentially does create a substantive private right of action available for, uh, to private individuals against law enforcement officers. It has provisions uh, that talk about certain uh, defenses and immunities that would be precluded from being used in a civil action. Um, and then also talks about the award of, re of attorney's fees to the plaintiffs and defendants in a, in a certain action and goes through uh, the liability coverage um, and indef indemnification by law enforcement agencies and by the law enforcement officer as well. Um, with that, I'll proceed on to section one. And as you can see at the bottom of this page, section one creates a new chapter 190 in title 12 of the Vermont statutes annotated entitled private right of action against law enforcement officers deprivation of state rights. Within this new chapter, 
There is a new section 5607 entitled liability of law enforcement officers. Subsection A of 5607 is a definition section. It defines law enforcement agency as having the same meaning in 20 VSA section 2351A, uh, as well as law enforcement officers in subdivision two uh, as having the same meaning in that uh, section as well. Law enforcement agencies are essentially uh, any employer of a law enforcement officer. And the definition of law enforcement officer essentially includes virtually all law enforcement officers in the state, um, municipal officers, constables, uh, state police, sheriffs, um, investigators, um, and so on and so forth. Subsection B is the substantive right of action that's created. It reads that an individual injured or damaged by the commission or omission of any act of a law enforcement officer acting under authority of the state or within the scope of authority of a law enforcement agency that violates the individual's rights guaranteed under provision of the constitution of the state of Vermont that provides a private right of action prescribed by Vermont statute or created by Vermont common law may bring an action for damages or equitable relief against the law enforcement officer. So essentially what subdivision B explains is that a person can bring a lawsuit against a law enforcement officer for any action or inaction that they made within the scope of their authority. Um, and they can pursue damages or equitable relief through that lawsuit. Subsection C uh, explains that an act brought pursuant to the section is not subject to common law doctrines of immunity as a defense to liability. So that would cover absolute and qualified immunity. Subdivision two, which reads that statutory immunities and statutory limitations on liability, damages, or attorney's fees uh, would not be subject to this, to an action here. Uh, subdivision three are the provisions of chapter 189 of this title, which is the Vermont Tort Claims Act. So that is carved out from uh, this, the, an action brought under this section. And then subdivision four is the provisions of 24 VSA chapter 33 subchapter two, which is essentially the municipal equivalent of the Vermont Tort Claims Act. So tort claims brought against municipalities or their employees as opposed to state employees. Um, in subsection D, uh, it reads that a court may award reasonable attorney's fees and other litigation costs reasonably occurred in any action brought under this section in which the plaintiff substantially prevailed. When a judgment is entered in favor of a defendant, a court may award reasonable attorney's fees and other litigation costs reasonably incurred to the defendant for, defendant, for defending any claims the court finds frivolous. So the first clause of subsection D um, essentially awards attorney's fees and costs to plaintiffs if they prevail uh, in an action. Uh, the second clause of subdivision of subsection D provides uh, such reasonable attorney's fees and costs to the defendant um, if their claims are frivolous, essentially meaning that if they didn't have merit to begin with. Moving on to subsection E, it reads that notwithstanding the provisions of three VSA chapter 29, chapter 189 of this title, or 29 VSA chapter 55, a law enforcement agency shall indemnify its law enforcement officer for any liability incurred and for any judgment or settlement entered against the law enforcement officer for claims arising pursuant to this section, except that if the law enforcement agency determines that the law enforcement officer did not act in good faith and under reasonable belief that the action was lawful, then the law enforcement officer is personally liable and shall not be indemnified by the law enforcement agency for 5% of the judgment or settlement or $25,000, whichever is less. So this section essentially says that a law enforcement agency must indemnify the police, a, a law enforcement officer, uh, so pay for any judgment or settlement that may be found, um, unless the law enforcement agency determines itself that the officer did not act in good faith and that their actions were not uh, reasonable uh, or that their belief that the action was lawful was not really reasonable. Um, and if that's the case, then the law enforcement officer 
is liable for 5% or $25,000, which is whichever is less of the judgment. Move, moving on to subsection F. Ben? Yes. Sorry, real quickly, I was muted. Um, in that paragraph you just read, it says a law enforcement agency shall indemnify, and then it gives an exception. And it seems to me that at the end of the sentence, you're talking about what percentage of the judgment uh, the indemnification will cover, but it's written in such a way that it makes it seem as though those percentages or settlement of $25,000, whichever is less, only apply if the person is not going to be indemnified. Right, that, so to clarify, that would be the percentage or amount that the law enforcement officer themselves would be personally liable for if they were not indemnified. Um, so that's a determination that the law enforcement agency would be able to make if they find that they did not act in, that the law enforcement officer did not act in good faith and under reasonable belief that the action was lawful. So, so am I understanding it correctly that the law enforcement agency can indemnify the officer for the full amount or they can indemnify them for 95%? I, I'm, I find that very confusing the way that's worded. So uh, I, I understand what you're saying. So in this case, the law enforcement has an obligation to fully indemnify the police officer if they are found liable, with the exception that essentially if they acted in bad faith and that's up to the law enforcement agency to decide, then the law enforcement officer themselves is liable for that 5% and 20, or $25,000. And so, yes, they would still be liable for potentially up to 95% or whatever amount um, is less. So essentially what it does is that it doesn't... Um, I, I think I, I see what you're saying. I, I think what it actually says is if they acted in bad faith, they shall not be indemnified for 5%. That, that doesn't say they will be indemnified for 95%, which is what I think you're, you're reading it to me. Well, it's really an exception. The presumption is that they are indemnified. Um, and they're required to be indemnified, but it just gives the law enforcement agency the discretion to determine the law law enforcement officer's actions. And yeah, I um, I, I mean, I think, it, and and we don't need to get into the this level of it here. But what what I would say is, and this is maybe a, a quarrel that I have with the legal profession as a whole. Um, you know, this is one one sentence paragraph long, and it creates so many bizarre um, potential misreadings. I, I would think if we went forward with this, this should be broken up into a couple of different um, sentences that, that make it very clear what the law enforcement agency is, is on the hook for and what they can get off the hook for. Because I, 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 I don't know, this is just very, very oddly worded, I think. Okay, so well, I'd, I'd be happy to, you know, make an attempt at some clarifying language for subsection E. Um, and just from my understanding, essentially just to separate out is specifically what the law enforcement agency is bound to do, and then the exception itself. Yeah. And, and make, the, make that language a bit clearer. Yeah, that, that would help me. That would probably help. I think it clearly the goal here is to um, allow the municipal or state agency to indemnify the officer unless the law enforcement agency determines that the person did not act in good faith. Senator Sears, could I ask a question? Yep. Um, ben, while you are contemplating Senator Baruth's question, I'm looking at this and wondering if a plaintiff comes along and sues both the officer and the agency, 
can the agency cross claim against the officer? I'm, I'm not digesting this enough to understand whether that would be a possibility. So if you could do a little research on that, it would be appreciated. Okay, I can do that. Um, why don't we move along to subsection F? Oh, Senator White or Vitka, did you have a comment? No, no, I had a, I had some questions, but I would like um, Ben to continue through the walkthrough first. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll continue on to subsection F. Um, in subsection F, it reads that notwithstanding any provision of this section to the contrary, to the extent that a law enforcement officer's portion of the judgment or settlement is uncollectible from the law enforcement officer, a law enforcement agency or the law enforcement agency's insurance shall, shall satisfy any such uncollected amount of the judgment or settlement. So this essentially ensures that a plaintiff will get paid um, if an officer is not able to pay themselves. And so the, the law enforcement agency or the insurance company uh, is obligated to satisfy any amount that the officer cannot pay for. And in subsection G, this is the statute of limitations portion where an action brought pursuant to this section shall be commenced within three years after the cause of action occurred. And section two is the effective date and the act shall take effect on July 1st, 2022. Okay, if there's any questions, I have a dog in the background that I have to calm down. Um, if you could take over, Senator Bruce, for a second. Sure. Um, ben, that's I, it for your walkthrough. I have some questions of Ben. Senator White. Thank you. So, Ben, this I think this is a question for you, that this... Do people now not have the right to sue a police officer, period? Um, well, there's no direct private right of action that would not be subject to qualified immunity um, under state law. Uh, there are various avenues, I mean, for individuals to sue law enforcement officers. They can do a Section 1983 claim, which is a federal uh, an action that can be brought in state or federal court for a violation of federal rights. Um, and anybody is free to sue, but whether, but qualified immunity is a defense that um, is often brought in such action against government officials. So what this is saying is that this is giving the, this is eliminating the ability to use qualified immunity as a defense in all cases. Correct. And okay. In, yeah, and so, that, that is covered in subsection C. Yep. So I have a couple more questions, if I might, Senator Baruth. Please. So um, this, I, I might be mistaken, but we are talking a lot about civil rights and the violation of civil rights, but this does not apply to a violation of civil rights. Am I right? Because civil rights is under federal law? Well, this would apply to civil rights under Vermont law. Um, and that is covered, outlined in subsection B, where it talks about the individual's rights guaranteed under a provision of the Constitution of the state of Vermont, providing a private right of action prescribed by Vermont statute or created by Vermont common law. So this would be page two, lines eight through 10. Um, and that's the difference here as opposed to a Section 1983 action, which is for federal rights. And Vermont rights, um, for instance, um, can often be ex more expansive than a federal right. Um, and therefore, this provides uh, an opportunity for redress for a violation of those rights um, and ones that are prescribed by statute or created by common law in Vermont. And we do have, we do have statutes and common law that protect civil rights? Um, well, it would be certain things, for instance, like common law, like negligence of uh, a negligence claim would be a common law action that could be brought. Um, but right now, uh, the Vermont Tort Claims Act, while that exists, that's something that can only be brought against the state itself, not against individuals. Um, and there are statutory rights uh, for instance, you know, excessive use of force and, and things like that that could be potentially brought under this uh, 
This but my understanding right. is that a civil right under the Federal Civil Rights um, Act that civil rights um, is um, an action taken because of somebody's, um, uh, because somebody belongs to a particular class, that that's the difference between a civil right and a constitutional right. Um, well, civil rights are often derived from a, a constitutional right. So for instance, a civil right is, uh, right to privacy or rights against unreasonable searches and seizures. Um, or, uh, so things like that, which are derived from federal, uh, the United States and Vermont constitutions. Okay, okay I'm, I'm still confused by that, but I don't wanna belabor this, but I, I do have a question about, um, this only applies to police, to law enforcement officers, right? Correct. Okay, so if, if the um, one of the of our capital police violated someone's constitutional rights, they would be covered. That person would be covered under this and would not be able to uh, use qualified immunity as a defense. But if the sergeant at arms violated somebody's um, constitutional rights, she would be able to use qualified immunity as a, as a defense. Uh, yes, as long as um, any law enforcement officer. So yes, and I, I'm not, um, I don't believe that the Sergeant at Arms is certified as a law enforcement officer. So right. if she's not, then correct. She, this would not apply to her. It only applies to certified law enforcement officers. And the same would be true for a game warden who did it, could not use qualified immunity, but the commissioner could. Correct, as long okay. as they are not certified as a law enforcement officer. Okay, thank you. Uh, Philip, I have a question, please. Please, Senator Nicka. I'm just wondering with regard to um, section E, page three, again, with the um, uh, insurance piece, um, what if um, a department doesn't carry insurance? What happens there? I know it says they shall do it, but if they don't and they don't have it, what happens then in terms of a violation here? Well, if the insurance, if they don't carry insurance, um, um, I'd, I'd have to do research into this, but there may be, I think, I believe there is an obligation to carry insurance, but I, I would like to research more into that for a, a law enforcement agency. But if there is no insurance and the claim can't be paid, then um, the plaintiff wouldn't necessarily be awarded any money. Um, you know, you, you can't, the, there wouldn't be a, a mechanism in which to pay at that point. I see. And I have one other question with regard to, um, uh, at some point in that, it appears that to me that um, the agency who might find the officer did not act in good faith um, might, dis might choose that route in order to um, protect themselves in terms of uh, them having to have their rates raised on their insurance. Is that? I suppose it's possible, but there are a lot of, um, you know, within Title um, 20, there are a lot of internal affairs procedures that law enforcement agencies need to adhere to in order to make sure that any investigation of its officers is is done in a proper way. Um, so while anything is possible, I, I would say that's probably unlikely to, to happen um, because of the construct of the internal affairs procedures that law enforcement agencies are subject to. Okay, thank you. I think and, important. Oh, yes. Sorry, Senator Sears. Uh, Senator Baruth, go ahead. Uh, ben, I, I think I figured out what is bothering me about uh, page, is this page, sorry, page three, subsection E. Mm -hmm. um, so it says, notwithstanding, a law enforcement agency shall indemnify its law enforcement <clears throat> officer for any liability. Um, that's one case. And then it says, except if the officer did not act in good faith, then the officer is personally liable. Now, to me, that says, that the LEA is not liable, the officer is liable. But then there's this additional clause and shall not be indemnified 
four or 5% of the judgment. So when I read that the officer is personally liable, that suggests a confusion to me about whether the law enforcement agency is going to be liable. In other words, why, why are they liable for 95% if the determination is made that the officer is personally liable? Um, so um, that's my confusion. And, and it's kind of unnecessary, I think, because it would be very easy to say that if the officer is, um, did not act in good faith, he receives only 95% and be done with it or the $25,000, whichever <clears throat> is less, however you want to frame it. But getting into the idea that the officer is personally liable and then somehow still implying that the LEA is 95% liable in that case is confusing. Okay. Um, and I think that really that determination about what that dividing line is between percentage or whatever is really kind of a policy consideration. But as yeah. far as the language itself, to kind of clarify it, I'm happy to, to parse it out a bit more to make it clear that the law enforcement agency is pr essentially presumed and obligated to indemnify, except in the situations of essentially bad faith, where the but law enforcement officer would be. But liable. no, they, they are. Even in bad faith, they're 95% liable. Correct. So, so that's the confusion, is to say that in one yeah. case they're not. They're, they're liable in both cases for either 95 or 100%. I think this right. can be straightened out rather. Uh, yeah. As yeah, we move I'm, along I'm happy on the bill. I think the issue is today, you'd find most police agencies are liable for 100%. Yeah. Um, unless there's uh, individual action, you know, the example being some of the cases nationwide, and further are even cases in the front where individual officers are being sued <clears throat> and their uh, police agency indemnifies. This is based on Colorado, and um, that we can work on that language. Uh, May I, I, think get, I think we're getting, I'd really like to get to the witness. Okay. Go ahead, right. Senator White. No, I just, that brought up another question for me when you said that right now um, the LEAs are, are liable when somebody is sued. And, and so I'm confused about what we're saying in this bill is that currently people can be sued. But when they go to court, they can use the qualified immunity, meaning that they acted within their scope of practice as a defense. What we're saying here is they cannot use that as a defense. Is that, do I understand no. that right? They can be sued, but they cannot use that as a defense in court. Yes, that's correct. Okay. The, let's um, move on. Are there any other questions about the draft? Thank you, Ben, for going through it. Um, yeah, my, my pleasure, Senator Sears. And I'll, I'll take a, a shot at clarifying the language in subsection E um, and great. get a draft returned. Um, um, at this point, Senator Sears, I'll, I'll cease sharing my screen and, and give yep. it back. Um, our first witness, um, the ideas from the American Civil Liberties Union. Yeah. Senator Sears, we, we can't hear you when you face away. And you could hear the dog well if I took her. <laughs> um, Jay, please welcome to Senate Jerry. You're not a stranger here. Um, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sears, and thank you all for having me and, and for taking up this important issue. Uh, for the record, my name is Jay Diaz. I am general counsel with the ACLU of Vermont. I'd like to start just by thanking Senator Sears again for his opening statement. Uh, he's correct. This is a bipartisan issue, uh, and the ACLU comes at it from a nonpartisan, as a nonpartisan legal and policy organization. 
Uh, we're interested in protecting civil and constitutional rights. And we think that this bill moves the ball forward in important ways to do that. Uh, so you know, I'd also like to thank the committee for its police reform efforts over the last several years. It's been uh, great to watch Vermont lead the nation in a number of areas where we can seek to reform policing, improve it, and uh, ensure that accountability is meaningful. So I know that we're here talking about S-254. What's really the crux of the issue is removing qualified immunity. And I, I heard a lot of the questions about some of the legal issues, and I'm happy I can answer those, um, uh, or I can try to, my best to answer those as a, as a lawyer um, later in the testimony, if you all like. Um, but I guess first, since we're here to talk about qualified immunity, let's talk about it. What is qualified immunity? What's important to recognize is that qualified immunity is a court created doctrine. It's about 50 years old, a little more than that. And what it does is that it basically says when a government official violates someone's rights, the victim doesn't necessarily get access to justice. What it says is that they will, they could go to court and they might be, that, that case might be dismissed very quickly. It might be dismissed very quickly, might be just dismissed at the end, simply because there was not already clear law that is beyond debate that the uh, government official knew or should have known that they were violating the person's rights. This is a heavy, standard. It makes it pretty difficult for people who have been victimized, either with egregious rights violations or with serious injuries, to actually access justice and be made whole through our court system. So that's really, you know, and it's not all people, but it's some. And that this is why this is an important fix that the legislature needs to make. But why does this doctrine even exist? It really stems from the important value and foundational principle of courts that they're not going to create new damage liability for other branches of government. So it's about separation of powers. So for 50 years, the ball has been in the legislature's court to take this up, legislatures around this country and in Vermont. But now this committee, thanks to S254 sponsors, Senator Sears, Senator Baruth, Senator Ballant and Senator Ron Hinsdale, for the first time in Vermont's history, a committee of the Vermont legislature has the opportunity to take a look at this issue, to see where our state stands when it comes to addressing civil rights violations and ensuring access to justice for victims of those violations. The ACLU of Vermont believes that it's a natural extension for, uh, of this committee's work and of the legislature's recent work to end qualified immunity, to ensure public accountability. And I'll talk about the reasons why we think that's so important in a few minutes. I just wanna go through what I'm gonna talk about quickly. Feel free to ask questions as I go through. I'm happy to uh, have this be a dialogue. So just quickly, I'm gonna talk about why we need to end qualified immunity and why that's so important. Access to justice, I mentioned, police accountability, ensuring trust in the judicial system, uh, forwarding racial justice, and because the public supports it broadly. Uh, I'll go over the few sections of the bill where there have been some questions. I'll respond to a couple of the concerns that we've heard from uh, some members of the law enforcement community, and then I'll be happy to answer any other questions. So most importantly, ending qualified immunity in the courts is about, uh, is about removing these insurmountable barriers for some victims of police misconduct. Now, I come at this as a, a litigator, as someone who's been a civil rights lawyer for the last 10 years in Vermont. And in every civil or constitutional rights case that comes our way, uh, that's about damages uh, against government employees or where government employees violated someone's rights, we have to do this qualified immunity analysis. And that's because there's this question that's left always hanging out for every case around civil and constitutional rights when you're talking about government officials. 
And that is this question of, as I mentioned before, whether there's quote unquote clearly established law. And that clearly established law, just as an aside, may never exist because courts are allowed to skip over uh, in any given case, whether they need to actually look at the right itself. They can just say the right's not clearly established whether it's true or not, or whether it's whether we would find it or not. So we're not going to do an analysis of the Fourth Amendment in these facts. So we're not going to do an analysis of the First Amendment on these facts. We're just going to say the law is not clearly established. So um, government officials you know, are going to get qualified immunity here. But it's even more complicated than that. It's even more difficult for victims to access justice than that. Because not only do you have to find clearly established law, to that applies to the facts of your case and that's virtually identical but you also need to find an appellate decision in your jurisdiction that does that that appellate jurisdiction needs to be formally published which many uh many decisions uh, in in the circuit courts and in the federal courts in particular are not published uh, and so that we're talking 50 to 70 percent of decisions the cases again have to have virtually identical identical facts not just those identical facts, but also facing the same legal questions. And of course, it can't, there can't be any cases in the same jurisdiction that call that clearly established law into question. The courts have said it needs to be beyond debate. Now, as a lawyer, I'll tell you, it's very difficult to get to beyond debate when we talk about civil and constitutional rights. I'm sure Senator Bedding can know what I'm talking about here because that's our job. Our job is to, uh, to distinguish cases and to show that things are not beyond debate or that they are beyond debate, but it's, it's a challenge to say the least. So even if you pass through all of these hurdles or you pass over all these hurdles, even then qualified immunity can still be the death knell of the most egregious rights violation case, including after trial and a full jury verdict because cases can always be distinguished. So qualified immunity creates these structural barriers that prevent meritorious cases of rights violations from succeeding, from making those victims whole. Many people actually won't even be able to bring cases in the first place because of qualified immunity, because attorneys know, can look up pretty easily whether clearly established law exists and have to weigh those risks of whether it's worth investing uh, hundreds, if not thousands of hours in a case, uh, which is going to be, you know, which can be very complicated and, and very uh, time consuming, of course, and work intensive, investing all that time, knowing that even if we win with a jury and the jury says, yes, you violated, uh, this person's rights were violated, that the belief or the, the fact that clearly established law didn't exist, that the law at issue was beyond debate, means that qualified immunity may prevent any liability and may ensure that the victim is never made whole and never receives justice. So I can give you just a few examples of cases. They're in the written testimony we've submitted. I'll go through them quickly here. Uh, the first case is the Kent v. Katz case. These are all Vermont cases, by the way, uh, that went to the, the federal courts. So uh, in Kent v. Katz, an officer did a wrist lock maneuver on a suspect and broke that person's wrist. The case went all the way through the jury, and the jury agreed, yes, excessive force, Fourth Amendment violation. But the jury then was forced to say, because of what the law says, that because the officer believed what they were doing was, was not wrong and didn't know that it was illegal, that that officer is immune from liability. And so that victim, the person who had their wrist broken, uh, is, is, is left uh, without any sense of justice, no judgment in their favor. Keen v. Schneider, another case, uh, a man was uh, let the police in his house, and then when they wanted to arrest him on suspected uh, charges, which were later dismissed, he was uh, pepper sprayed, thrown to the ground, beaten in front of his crying 14-year-old daughter because he wouldn't put his hands behind his back. 
same thing here. The, because clearly established, <clears throat> excuse me, because clearly established law did not exist, there could be no liability and the officers were immune. In Winfield v. Trotter, officers, uh, uh, an officer performed a warrantless search and uh, of a vehicle. And while doing that search, found a piece of mail and decided to open the mail and read it. Now, this is something we can all agree is pretty well known that you don't read another person's mail. Uh, and you certainly, and certainly the Fourth Amendment and Article 11 in Vermont say, you know, we're, we gotta be secure in our papers. This is a pretty serious violation. And the Second Circuit noted that and said, yes, violation of the Fourth Amendment right, no question. And still here, qualified immunity applied. And that's because there was some debate in the courts about in this particular circumstance where the witness or where the um, plaintiff and victim gave general consent to do a search, whether an officer, whether that meant the officer could also read the person's mail. I think we could all say that it's, we wouldn't think that that would be the case. Other cases in the second circuit uh, have had this similar problem. Uh, it's just a case that was mentioned in, in the law enforcement uh, written testimony and uh, is from 2019, the Kajini case, uh, a woman was handcuffed so tightly that she ended up having permanent nerve damage in her wrists. And in that case, the court said, yeah, there's a lot of similar cases. And we've said that tight handcuffing is, can be excessive force. But in this case, because the officer did not, uh, because the woman only said ow a couple times and made some cries, but didn't say more, they were gonna grant qualified immunity, despite you know, what they assumed would be excessive force. So if we remove qualified immunity from the equation, we remove an unjust barrier that prevents victims like this and others from being made whole. S-254 ensures that meritorious claims where excessive force or rights violations are found in the first place that those people can achieve justice and not be denied on this technicality. This is the most important thing, the most important reason we need to get rid of qualified immunity in Vermont. There are many <clears throat> other reasons why we should get, we should remove qualified immunity in these instances. Uh, of course, police accountability is an important piece of the puzzle here, but it's not about particular law enforcement officers. This bill actually has very little to do with and very little impact on individual officers. This bill is about, and I think qualified immunity is about incentivizing municipalities, state government, and law enforcement agencies themselves to prioritize uh, better hiring, training, and oversight practices to prevent rights violations. This will create a culture of accountability. Officers are largely held harmless, except in these limited circumstances, which you've talked about. And, but, and greater accountability is really important here because it creates greater community trust. That's what is necessary to good policing. And that's what all law enforcement believe they need is community trust. And right now we're still in a moment where that is not there, but this will help create that. Not only will it create trust in greater trust in law enforcement, but it will also create credibility for the system. When victims, and I'm talking about the judicial system most importantly here, when victims don't have access to justice, it undermines the credibility of the entire justice system. People see qualified immunity, just get, see cases get dismissed on qualified immunity, the most egregious cases where people are, just cannot believe their eyes that a, a court would say, you don't, you don't get to be made whole here. So if we end qualified immunity, there will be less public confusion over egregious cases, uh, and we'll make sure that those victims can receive justice. People believe they should have their day in court. Police in right now, they get their day in court, but victims don't. This will not mean necessarily we know the outcome, but we will ensure fairness in the system. Uh, just a couple more here. There's also a racial justice aspect to this. Qualified immunity is a longstanding, longstanding facet of systemic racism. It perpetuates systemic oppression 
by standing between those who are disproportionately likely to be victims of police misconduct and violence and the justice they deserve. And of course, there's broad support for this bill. Nearly 75% of Vermonters in a recent poll said that they support eliminating qualified immunity for police. So I'll be happy to just go through the bill very quickly and just to speak our opinion on what the bill has to say. Uh, and again, I'm happy to answer questions as we go along. I know there were some about provisions in the bill. So we've talked a lot about the provisions that remove immunity from, from law enforcement officers. So I won't go through that. And I just wanna talk about two others, the attorney's fees provision. I wanna emphasize that this is a discretionary provision that would, which is similar to the federal, uh, what's available under the under federal statute section 1983. It allows the courts to have, uh, have discretion to provide attorney's fees where a plaintiff substantially prevails. So that's in the court's discretion. In our experience, courts still don't like to, or are still reluctant to uh, provide attorney's fees. If you look at what happened under the Public Records Act, we had to come back and make sure that courts, uh, that the statute said that courts shall provide attorney's fees because, because they're generally reluctant to do so. This only gives courts that discretion and leeway. And then finally, talking about indemnification, I know there are some questions on this. Right now, we indemnify all police officers in Vermont. Municipalities indemnify officers and the state indemnifies officers, except in limited circumstances where there was gross negligence or willful misconduct. Even then, officers are typically indemnified uh, uh, by choice of the state. And so we think it's likely, um, we think you know, continuing to give that choice to uh, municipalities and, and local governments and state government about whether they will hold uh, uh, their employees to have any measure of liability uh, in keeping with this, in keeping with the normal, what's typically been done uh, in, in the past in Vermont. But adding an, a, a particular incentive where an officer is acting in bad faith, uh, at least will we'll hopefully do more to prevent the most egregious cases. So just responding to a couple of the concerns that I've heard raised in, in written testimony. You know, some, some have said that this won't impact accountability at all. And I would just say that removing a barrier to accountability and justice increases accountability and access to justice, period. It's not complicated. While this may not, uh, while, while not every case is going to be prevented from accessing justice because of qualified immunity, some definitely are. And that is what we're trying to resolve today. I also wanna make sure it's clear, this is not about singling out police officers. This is about access to justice for victims. And as I mentioned before, in fact, this, this bill before you actually has very little direct impact on law enforcement officers. This is about fixing a problem that has been before the legislature for 50 plus years, a problem created by, by court doctrine. And, uh, and now we have an opportunity for the first time to right that wrong to say where the state stands when it comes to civil and constitutional rights violations, how we will make victims whole. The only reason that we, that this bill starts with police officers is really because they have the most awesome power of any state employee or any municipal employee. And with great power comes not only great responsibility, but also must come great accountability. And we believe that this will bring that accountability to the system itself, ensuring that proper hiring, training, and uh, oversight. So again, I'll close with appreciation for the Judiciary Committee's work to improve access to justice and police accountability. This legislation is necessary 
and it's a continuation of the work that you all have already been doing for the past several years. The time is now for the legislature to decide for this first time whether qualified immunity represents good civil rights policy in Vermont. We say it is time to end qualified immunity and protect Vermonters constitutional and civil rights in our courts. So we strongly urge you to support this bill uh, that would remove this unjust barrier to victims of police misconduct. Move us toward a law enforcement culture of accountability, create uh, a greater trust between law enforcement and communities they serve. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop and happy to answer any of your questions, but I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Jay. Um, I'm very, um, I have one question then Senator White and then maybe others. Um, I think it's fair to say no one likes frivolous lawsuits. Um, yet, over the years, talking with corrections commissioners, the number of times they're sued is, is like unbelievable because uh, it's rather a litigious group. How do we get um, filter out some of those more frivolous lawsuits that um, I think there's a lot of fear in the law enforcement community. They're going to be forced. Every decision they make is going to result in some kind of a frivolous lawsuit. How do we distinguish between those and serious kinds of cases? And I, and I, I agree that part of the problem that you've identified and others have identified with qualified immunity is there's no consistency in what cases um, give the police officer qualified immunity and what cases don't. So I wonder if you could comment on those two. Absolutely. Thanks for the question, Senator Sears. So let's just start by saying that in, in terms of filing lawsuits, anyone can file a lawsuit against anyone else. It's, it's not something that really can be prevented beforehand. What this bill does is say if a frivolous lawsuit is filed, that, that the filer is going to be liable for the costs and fees of the defendant. So that's one way we can disincentivize those kinds of lawsuits. And I think this bill does that in, in, a, in a way that's common among other, other pieces of legislation that we've already taken up. Uh, I, and I, I also don't see that as, as being realistic here. Um, thankfully, when we look at Colorado, Mexico, uh, other, other places that have recently reformed qualified immunity, or eliminated it, we're not seeing a wave of frivolous lawsuits. Thank you. Senator White. Thanks. Thanks, Jay. Um, good to see you again. I, um, I do have a couple questions. Um, and I know that you said that this does not um, single out police officers and that they have a lot of um, this is not meant to single out police officers, that police officers have a lot of, of uh, authority and, and responsibility, but this does single out police officers because others also have a lot of authority and responsibility. This does not address the, um, the uh, commissioner of corrections if he violates or she violates um, someone's constitutional rights. It, uh, my two examples of the Capitol Police and the Sergeant at Arms, it would not ident it, it does single out police officers. So if we wanted to get rid of qualified immunity as a, as a defense, why would we not do it for everyone instead of just singling out police officers? Because the commissioner of Fish and Wildlife might have a lot of um, authority also as might the sergeant at arms or the town manager who is actually the employer of the law enforcement officers. Yeah, so I, I understand the, the concern. I think what I'd say is that the ACLU does not have uh, any uh, opposition to covering other public officials, you know, corrections officials or others. However, we start with law enforcement officers not just because of the great power they have, uh, but it's also the, the power they can and, and are authorized to use in public, in everyday interactions, in, in spaces of general freedom. 
And that includes the power to use force, an exclusive power to use force, and at sometimes um, use deadly force. So that is unlike any other public employee uh, uh, that, that's out there. And, and so there is, you know, with that great, great power, um, we think it's important to have uh, stronger mechanisms by which victims of that power, when it comes to constitutional civil rights violations, can receive, can, can be made whole after the fact. And it's the, it's the state, it's the, it's the government entities that employ these officers that are, um, are going to be taking the action to, to make that person whole. So it's mainly around the physical um, ability of the law enforcement officers to, to um, impose physical harm on people as opposed to um, um, any other, any, because all those other people would have the same rights to, uh, or the same ability to um, violate constitutional rights, but they, they don't have the right to use force. I don't think so. And, and that's because it's not only that there's the ability to use force, but there's the ability, the ability to arrest. There's the ability to search uh, and search people on the street, search people while they're in their cars, going about their business uh, of daily life. And so this is where, you know, a longstanding constitutional doctrine really comes from. It's, it's about protecting people in their daily lives. And so where rights violations occur to people, uh, uh, happen to people in their daily lives, that's what we're saying. That's where we need to make sure there is some ability to access justice. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions for Jay? Senator Benning. Okay, good morning. Um, I keep hearing the term made whole, and I just want to be clear as to what your experience is. We require every law enforcement agency to be equipped with insurance to cover situations where people may be injured in such a way that um, you can classify it the officer's fault or whatever you want to describe it as, but if they are injured, there is a remedy there for them to pursue. I don't believe any of the cases you cited uh, involved individuals who were prevented from getting a remedy of some sort because we require that these agencies be insured. The difference here when you use the term be made whole is that they've been prevented from also getting a remedy from the officer directly. Am I misconstruing something there? Yeah, I'm sorry for any misunderstanding. No, we're, we're talking specifically about what, uh, whether it's an insur insurance company or, or the, the entity that the government entity that's going to be indemnifying the officer. We're just speaking about victims being able to access uh, damages uh, awards, being able to, I mean, that's what our system provides people to be made whole. Our, our courts don't have other mechanisms um, other than providing for damages and attorney's fees to compensate people for, for their rights violations or for their injuries. And so that's all I'm talking about. I'm not speaking here about uh, holding uh, police officers, um, that making sure that, 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 um, that it, it's not about any, anyone's particular resources going to a victim. It, it's, about, it's about just making sure that the victim is able to access the justice they deserve. I just want to be clear that this is not a situation where a plaintiff either gets something or doesn't get something. The only real question is what pockets they can actually get something from. Um, and in my case, I've been a lawyer for a few years. Normally, I would, if I was representing a plaintiff, go after everybody I possibly could in a given situation and see how many pockets can produce a remedy. Uh, but I, I want to be clear here that we're not talking about a bill that is going to give somebody something that they were otherwise completely deprived of. I think that's an important distinction to make um, because I, I, I don't believe any of the plaintiffs that you've cited uh, were prevented from getting a remedy uh, of some kind, but in the way you've described it as not getting uh, whole justice is that they were actually prevented from getting something out of one particular pocket. 
Am I clear as mud? Or I don't is think that... that's accurate. I think that thing, I don't think that's accurate. I think the, yeah, in the cases I cited, um, if, when you go to federal court uh, over a rights violation of a police officer, you are you sue the individual officer. That's required by federal law. Uh, and so these cases were specifically about the actions of the officer, and the officer is, of course, indemnified. So you're always, it, in, the, in the end, if you're able to get a damages award, it's always going to be from the officer's employer. And so, uh, but you're forced to name the particular officer. So it's not about any particular pocket. It's actually what qualified immunity did in these cases is, is say, nope, you, yes, you had a rights violation, but no, you don't get to collect from anybody to compensate you for the injuries you sustained. Okay. I did raise a question earlier and I was hoping you could give me an answer. I'm still trying to digest the language, but is there anything here that prevents a cross claim by a, an agency uh, in the event that they are sued as well as the officer um, to fight for some damages from the officer him or herself? So I, I think that that is possible under current law where an officer, uh, or, or if the state or the uh, government entity believes the officer acted with gross negligence or willful misconduct. And similarly, that would be, I suppose, possible here where the government agency believed the officer acted in bad faith, which is very similar. Okay, thank you. I don't know why. But, but I will say that the, the, I will say that it's very rare. I, I, I have never seen it happen, and um, it's kind of an open question in current law. I've never seen it happen, even in cases where there is gross negligence or, or willful misconduct. Government entities will typically indemnify and represent the uh, the government employee throughout that process. Well, now we have qualified immunity, and. I would guess you've never seen it because once a, an agency pays out, uh, I would assume that the same qualified immunity could be applied in a case of a, an attempted cross claim. Um, but I, I want to think about it further. Thanks. Uh, using my example, the sheriff's office, um, it's none of my business. So I wouldn't know what what recourse anybody had if something happened. So I, as a citizen, a taxpayer, wouldn't be privy to any information that didn't come as a result of the lawsuit. So all we know is settlements happen. I mean, I've seen, I believe, three in the last two years in Bennington where there's been settlements reached in cases. Um, they never got to trial. I don't know what, you know, that, I'm not here to talk about individual cases, but, you know, we as taxpayers are left scratching our heads yep. as to what happened. Senator Baruth and then Senator White. Uh, thank you, Jay. Good, good to see you. Um, it was a long time ago in education committee. We were working on uh, issues there, um, but good to see you in this context. Um, I find myself going back to page three of the bill, and um, I'll just read the language. Uh, a law enforcement agency shall indemnify its law enforcement officer for any liability occurred, uh, dot, 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 except if the law enforcement agency determines that the law enforcement officer did not act in good faith and under reasonable belief that the action was lawful. Now I'm, I'm struck by that because there's been a judgment that constitutional rights were violated, that harm was brought to this individual and uh, you know restitution is gonna be made. But then there's an, a second judgment made by the law enforcement agency, whether to hold the officer personally liable. And, that seems to me still like a very uh, favorable state of affairs for law enforcement, um, that 
there, no money is going to come out of their pocket personally unless their own home agency, their own fellow officers say that they acted in bad faith. Um, that seems to me a real protection under this bill for individual officers uh, who have been found to have committed a violation. They still have what I would imagine in practice is a very good chance of not being held personally liable by their home agency. So I, I have been confused a little bit by the argument that some people have made that this targets police officers or that it will ruin their lives. This still seems to me a very advantageous circumstance to have the final determination of whether somebody's personally liable be made by their employing law enforcement agency. And I'm wondering if you can just comment on that. I think that's absolutely correct. Uh, you know, the fact that currently law enforcement is indemnified in most of these circumstances and that they will continue to be indemnified, meaning that no money is, is ever going to come out of their pocket, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for, for anything they do, even if that action is unreasonable, even if they violate someone's Fourth Amendment rights in an unreasonable, which, which by definition is an unreasonable search or seizure or unreasonable excessive force, they still might not have any personal liability uh, in, in the sense that, they, that any money is going to come out of their pocket. Mm -hmm. the, I, again, you know, uh, police agencies are, uh, and it's important in some ways that they are protective of their officers. Uh, they don't want to see them harmed. It's only in the most egregious cases, and you've seen this because only in the most egregious cases are officers disciplined or fired for, for uh, misconduct that they would even consider making this kind of determination, in my experience, at least. I'm, I'm mindful of the time, though. And, I, can... and, I, and I'll finish, finish up. The, the last thing I wanted to say is I, I think some people have a view of this bill that it leaves the individual officer at the mercy of, uh, you know, uh, a tort system gone wrong. It doesn't. Um, it's, it's really their own law enforcement agency that will make the determination of whether they are personally liable. So um, thanks, Jerry. I appreciate it. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, Senator White, final no, question. I'll wait. I'll okay. wait. Thank you. I want to move on to thank you, Jay, very much for being with us and uh, appreciate it. Good to, always good to see you. Great to um, see you all. Thanks again, and happy to come back anytime. Okay. Um, I want to announce, for the record, we have to close at noontime. And so anyone um, at the end of the schedule who needs to leave or has a problem, if you could let Peggy know, um, we'll try to accommodate you today or accommodate you at the next time we have this meeting. Our next witness is... Uh, Public Safety Commissioner uh, Michael Sherling, and welcome to Senate Judiciary. Good morning, Senator. Uh, thanks for inviting us in on uh, this topic. Um, for the record, Mike Sherling, I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety. Um, I, my testimony, I believe, will be uh, relatively short. I'm going to provide a high-level overview of our uh, position, and Will DeWhite, uh, who is also an attorney, will uh, uh, provide uh, quite a bit more scope uh, and depth uh, to the Department of Public Safety's position. You should each have uh, a position memorandum um, that is uh, authored and co-sponsored by a host of organizations, both inside and outside law enforcement. Um, and for the first time uh, in the, I'm not sure how many years I've be, been coming before your uh, committee, Senator, uh, there is unanimity uh, in position. And, uh, and I will note another difference that normally I am here to try to find a path to yes, uh, to try to figure out how to make uh, a bill work. Um, I think we have a long history of collaboration uh, and uh, work toward operational improvements. And important to note that law enforcement has been driving modernization for a couple of decades now, um, and unfortunately has gotten uh, almost no uh, credit for that effort in recent years. Um, but this uh, testimony is quite different. Uh, I'm gonna testify briefly, as I indicated, um, 
And I should simply note from the outset that uh, we'll, we'll get to this, whether it's today or on a subsequent day, that our legal analysis outlined in the physician paper uh, and the testimony you will hear differs dramatically from that uh, which the ACLU just testified to. Um, there is unanimity among public safety professionals on the position here. Um, we are not here to try to make uh, a bill better. Uh, we are here to tell you this is not a good piece of public policy. Um, this abandons the progress that we're making uh, in favor of opening a very wide lane of litigation. Um, it's important to note, I think as it's been sort of tangentially mentioned, but not directly called out that all government employees are covered by qualified immunity. That includes legislators, teachers, firefighters, uh, folks in every agency and department of state government, all municipal employees. Um, and to say that this isn't targeting law enforcement is just not accurate. This is a bill that exclusively targets law enforcement for the removal uh, of a key legal doctrine that the Vermont Supreme Court has noted as late as 2019 um, rightfully protects against a predictable flood of litigation. Uh, using their words. It's part of a national campaign to end qualified immunity. Um, and it's important to note that uh, policing is not national. What is happening in other states, examples uh, of cases that you're hearing about in other states simply don't bear resemblance in most instances to what happens here in Vermont. Policing is local and the application of qualified immunity is also local and on a federal level, it is regional. Uh, policing in California, New York, or even a city as close as, uh, as Boston uh, bears little resemblance to the way policing is done in Vermont. Uh, and I can't overstress that. This is uh, quite simply a backdoor to dismantling uh, law enforcement operations and to, to defunding. It's just a different approach. Um, it, if this is about a flawed legal doctrine, um, it is curious to me why this isn't being contemplated as a change to qualified immunity across the entire spectrum of litigation, why it is only law enforcement. Uh, it's important to note that this initiative already has um, contributed to exacerbating an ongoing staffing crisis in public safety. And if this were to pass, it will dramatically exacerbate exacerbate that staffing crisis. Uh, and the, a number of officers will leave and those who choose to stay will have no choice but to disengage from critical responses in some instances because they will simply not know where the ground under them is because it will be invisible. We should be investing in professionalizing, reducing errors, increasing consistency, and not simply putting the taxpayer on the hook for a very expensive bills in insurance premiums and litigation costs and attorney's fees. It strikes me that the taxpayers would be much better served uh, if they were fully informed of what qualified immunity is by investing in good public safety rather than trying to address uh, serious issues after they have occurred. Um, this effort is regressive. It addresses misconduct or errors after they've happened rather than investing in trying to improve outcomes at the front end. We don't do that when it comes to things like healthcare or education. We are not talking about disinvesting and figuring out how to sue teachers and healthcare workers for bad outcomes. The key ingredients have been mentioned here. Um, but I disagree with the method to get to those key ingredients. Our modernization strategy outlines um, those keys. Good leadership in law enforcement organizations and in government, uh, great hiring practices, good training, supervision, policy, uh, policy evolution, uh, good selection of supervisors, uh, good disciplinary processes, good oversight, et cetera. And though uh, the tapestry of those things is what will create the organizations that we want and the outcomes uh, that we're looking for. Our brief provides a detailed account of our position, the impacts, how the courts have addressed qualified immunity, both in Vermont and in the Second Circuit. And as I indicated, it differs dramatically from the assessment you've heard so far. It also gives uh, an assessment of the cases of concern that you shared, uh, Senator, that were the basis for concerns around QI in Vermont. Uh, and I think that's incredibly uh, illuminating. Um, 
put simply, you know, increasing litigation is not going to improve our outcomes. It's not going to improve our law enforcement agencies. Um, it may do exactly the opposite. Uh, and it's far afield from anything I've ever seen um, uh, as a policy initiative in Vermont. It simply doesn't strike me as the Vermont way of solving problems. Go to a courtroom and increase litigation. So that's my, uh, that's my testimony in a nutshell. Uh, that position is shared, as I indicated, with, by a host of organizations, by every law enforcement agency in Vermont, uh, by the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Um, and I can't overstress the level of concern uh, and frankly sadness that, that this is where we're at relative to our approach to uh, trying to improve the operations of government. I appreciate your time and uh, Wilda will have a, a far greater uh, and in-depth analysis. Thank you. Um, appreciate your testimony. Senator Benning has a question or comment. Commissioner, real quick, um, are you aware of any insurance that is available to an individual officer who is about to become employed that would cover them in this particular situation? We're doing some research on that now, Senator, in the event that uh, this were to come to pass. Uh, we believe it exists. It is incredibly expensive. And we would I think to, in order to make it function, it would be something that would eventually fall to the taxpayers. The collective bargaining units would be in negotiations looking for the taxpayer to cover the cost of those premiums because uh, frankly, we don't pay people enough uh, to be able to afford them. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Commissioner Sherwin? Commissioner, I do have that document um, I believe it's the same one that Mike O'Neill sent out. Is that the same document? It is. It is, uh, again, as I indicated, for the first time in the 30 years I've been doing this, as unified a position as, as I've ever seen. Thank you. Um, it would, if Mike is on or if you can uh, send a copy of that to Peggy to be posted on the web page of the Judiciary Committee. Certainly, apologies. I thought that had been done, but I'll do that now. Uh, I noticed it wasn't on there, and so that would be helpful uh, for the public looking in. Senator White, did you have a question or comment? I thought I saw your hand. Anybody else for Commissioner Sherwin? Commissioner, thank you very much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. And uh, we'll continue the conversation on this and a host of other issues. Um, our next witness. Or would you rather take a short period? Senator Sears, when you bend down, we can't hear you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was looking for my, um, would you prefer to take a short break now or wait until after the next witness? I would love a five minute break if that okay. was is okay with Wilda. Uh, actually, Will is not the next witness, oh. but oh, okay. um, she'll be coming up, um, I hope. It's 1028, so why don't we get back at, 20, at 1035.